delighted to be joined exclusively by uh, Joe Flanagan, who played the one and only uh, Colonel John Shepherd in uh, Stargate Atlantis. And I suppose, uh, Joe, Stargate SG-1, Stargate Atlantis, shown all over the world, from Brazil to Spain, yep. to Australia, different languages. Uh, you can hear it in Spanish, Italian, German, French. Yeah. Full following all over the world. Um, how big a part of it as that the, the character uh, John Shepard being a part of your life and being part of the Stargate franchise? And I suppose Stargate is big in the USA, but do you realize the significance and how big it is worldwide? Well, first of all, it's lucky that I speak 37 languages. So I'm not sure the show would have happened without that skill set. But um, it, it's one of the greatest privileges of my life. It's been able to play a character that has traveled so far around the world. Um, and science fiction, I have my opinions about science fiction. And, and there's a reason why science fiction is like a universally appealing thing. Um, because I think people, they it's a universal thing to, to kind of like dream about being in space, space travel, all that sort of stuff. And you're dealing with these classic, classic myth structures of heroes going out, being transformed and coming back. So it, what's amazing, and I tell my other friends that are actors, and they're successful actors, but they haven't actually had any science fiction uh, success in their their resume. So they don't know what it's like to actually, you know, be able to go all over the world, sign autographs and have a fan base all over the world in quite the same way. And, you know, the science fiction fans are, are they're incredible. They're the best fans to have. As yeah, you can I tell, know. I'm trying to, I'm such an actor. I'm trying to find my light. And I suppose, uh, Joe, uh, I suppose Stargate Atlantis followed in the footsteps of a huge successful Stargate SG-1. And I suppose yeah. principal hero and uh, in that character was the character Jack O'Neill, played right. uh, by Richard Dean Anderson. And I suppose it's, it's similarities in some sense uh, in terms of the spotlight cast on yourself in, star in terms of Stargate Atlantis. You fill the main uh, male character in that sort of show like uh, right. Richard Dean. And obviously there's going to be comparisons made and uh, in terms of Stargate Atlantis, because you had to stand on your own two feet. Did that ever bother you at the start, thinking, right, people are going to compare me to the Jack O'Neill character, my character, to uh, Richard Dean Anderson, or did it ever come into your thinking? Okay, well, that's interesting. So when I first started out, um, they the question I got asked by the press the most was, how are you going to fill the, the, the shoes of Jack O'Neill? He's, he's a giant. He's an icon. He's this, he's that. And my answer was Jack who? <laughs> I don't know who Jack O'Neill is. I've never watched Stargate and I hadn't. And I purposely didn't watch Stargate because I didn't want it to affect the way I wanted to approach my character. Um, after the first uh, episode aired, I was never asked that question again. It's really interesting. I've never asked a question in relation to me or Jack O'Neill again, ever. Um, but it was a question I got asked the most before the show aired. So I realized I was dealing with something significant and that clearly he was this iconic figure. And I've since watched Stargate uh, SG-1 since then. And, you know, I'm really glad I didn't watch it because I didn't, I, I'm glad it didn't affect me because he's, I think he, what he does is great. I love what he does. He's got this crazy, quirky, idiosyncratic approach to things. And it makes you interested and you're paying attention and you're watching things. You try to compare his character to Kurt Russell's in the movie. Yeah. And it's very different. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't think the show would have been successful with Kurt Russell. I think Richard Dean Anderson was so quirky and so bizarre that it threw everybody for a little bit of a loop. They were like, what's that guy doing? That guy's kind of eccentric. Hey, wait a minute. This show, this show is actually kind of funny. And, and it, I think that helped build a cult following. And I think it also broke things up in the show for the show to have fun. Because I, I really honestly think that, that one thing that makes the Stargate franchises a little different than other shows is that it has fun. 
it's trying to have fun and it's trying to have the audience have fun with them. And Star Trek is much more serious. Um, and so th I think that's the, the power of, of Stargate. So to answer your question is um, the Jack O'Neill character uh, is, is genius. And I'm glad I didn't know it. So it didn't affect my, my take on things. Yeah, I suppose, uh, Joe, in terms of getting a uh, casting for the role, you probably saw the script and in terms of uh, Stargate Atlantis and uh, your character, uh, John Shepard. And what was your initial reaction to this whole sort of Atlantis thought and team and outworld and traveling through uh, an alien Stargate uh, sort of different world? How did you think, how, what, how did you think it appear in your head before you actually saw the live product? What was your idea thinking how this might come across well when i was given the show see a lot of people don't know that that i did a lot of work before this show i was on a lot of different shows and i had done i think stargate might have been my 13th or 14th network pilot like i'd done a lot and stargate came along and when i was told about it from my agent I was like, uh, or my manager, I said, well, I mean, I don't know that I can do science fiction television. I mean, don't those people on Star Trek, they're very like serious and they wear their one piece suit and they do, I go, do I, I'm not sure that I want to do that. And they said, that is not what the show is. The show is a much more self-deprecating kind of adventure. It's a little mix of Indiana Jones with Star Trek. It's, it's a little different. And I said, well, meaning what? And they said, well, you can put your own take on the character, go in and read and, you know, do what you want with the character. And, and I think that's what they're looking for to see your own take on it. So I went in and I did it and they liked it. And what was more appealing was that, that the show was basically picked up for two years. Now <laughs> I've done a lot of shows that had not been picked up for two years, uh, pilots and things like that. And it's, uh, that was appealing. So um, it was actually, it was a very easy thing. It was one of the easiest castings I've ever done. I mean, I went in and read for it and 24 hours later, the deal was done and everything was really simple and it ended up being a great decision. I suppose, uh, Joe, in terms of uh, the original Stargate, uh, the villains were these sort of gauls, sort of alien snakes that uh, take over your head. Gee, this sort of different sort of take. It was more vampirish in, in sort of uh, nature, a uh, sort of uh, blood sucking uh, ray type uh, sort of characters that would suck the, the life out of uh, a human sort of aspect. And I suppose uh, in terms of the actual on stage and shooting those uh, sort of interactions and I suppose they were very enjoyable, but uh, in terms of when you actually got to see it on screen and replayed uh, back to you in terms of those effects, were you sort of taken back from what you were actually shooting those scenes and those <laughs> characters? I imagine it looked an awful lot more. You mean did I ever did I ever have any like like moments of clarity where I said, "What am I doing?" <laughs> yes, <laughs> and it happened on like the second or third or fourth episode. I can't remember. And I can't remember what it was, but we had not worked out the kinks. We had built sets. We had done all this stuff, but we had not built things properly. So there was a testing period. We built the puddle jumper, but we built the puddle jumper to size instead of split apart. So you can get a crew in and film and shoot. So we were shooting with this director, Mario Atsu Prado, I think is his name. Is this like, wild Cypriot and um, he is a fun director to work with because he would watch somebody do it and he'd be like I don't fucking believe you I don't fucking believe you <laughs> and he would really make the actor like you know step up and I had a plastic bug tied to me with fishing wire okay. and it was such a bad bug it was like I could have done better. I could have made a better bug. And it was attached to my neck. It was really uncomfortable. We're all sweating our asses off in there. And we're in there for like two or three days. And I'm like this. And I thought to myself, what did I sign up for? What have I done? Now, 
this is an interesting lesson for me because when I went and finally saw the episode, it actually looked much better than I thought it was going to look. I actually thought I am making the worst B movie crap. This is what am I doing? Like, this is going to be terrible. You know, the guys at Stargate, if you look from the beginning in our effects and everything else to the end, it was an incredible evolution. And the show just started looking better and better and better as the years went on, as the uh, technology got better. And then after that, I was able to like relax a little and be like, you know what? They've got, they've taken care of this. I, I'm not going to look like a total moron unless I don't know how to act. Everything else is taken care of. And that was like a great relief. So, but listen, there are moments all the time when you're sitting there and you're saying to yourself, like you're, you're in a, you're in a spaceship made of plywood and styrofoam. And you're thinking to yourself, this was an interesting career choice, Joe. What am I doing? You know, (laughs) it, it is not, a conventional lifestyle. Uh, But on the other hand, we're really getting paid to play. So it's fun. I suppose, um, Joe, in terms of your casting mates as well, Rachel, Luttrell, uh, played Tia. But the interesting what I thought was uh, the character Jason Momoa played. uh, They were trying to make, I thought, comparisons there in terms of the Tia character in Stargate, which was played by Christopher Judge. And at times, uh, it's uh, two very sort of personalities, but later on in, in towards the seasons, they let uh, Jason's character become more sort of relaxed and not really more that sort of T character that we saw originally sort of stuff. I think maybe that they found that maybe to express more in terms of uh, Jason Momoa's character to, to really get the good side, good side out of that character aspect. Well, you know... Um... When I, they sent me to Los Angeles to read for, um, to read with the characters uh, of, of Ronan. And so I read with like four or five different actors or something. I like Jason because Jason was this gigantic dude with dreadlocks. And in my mind, I was like, that's, that's Chewbacca. Yeah, yeah. And Chewbacca makes me Han Solo. And this is going to work great. <laughs> so I always saw him that way. Um, and you know what Chewbacca is. Chewbacca is like, you know, a big kind of fuzzy giant that can be ferocious, but is really just a big fuzzy giant. Um, I think the, the, I don't think they knew what to do with Jason's character for a while. I think it took a while. And then as Jason's character became popular, I think they were like, oh, okay, we can invest in the storylines and make him more this and that. Um, you know, here, it's the first time, if, I, if I'm correct, I think it's the first time Jason was on a, a long running show, like where you had to wake up every day and be at work for, I think he was on the show for four years. Um, so I think that, you know, he really learned what like work was and he's, you know, really disciplined, I mean, I think it, it was great training ground for him for all the work he's done in terms of his ability to fly all over the world, wake up at difficult hours, be at work and be ready. Um, and, you know, the truth is a lot of his characters are similar. <laughs> it's, he play, you, I mean, when you look like that, you're going to play a certain character. Um, and so uh, interestingly enough, I'm actually in Toronto right now yeah. in a 14 day hotel quarantine. This is my seventh day, uh, and I'll be picking up my third episode of C that's Jason's show. So I'm shooting C right now with him, um, and the quarantine interrupted us. So he and I are still great friends, and uh, and I think we, we were going to quarantine together, but then we thought, well, maybe we won't be such good friends after that. <laughs> On that note, Joe, you might uh, give a shout out to Jason and uh, let him know about this. And sure, we might get him on uh, in the next. Absolutely. Sure. But uh, Joe, uh, back to uh, the in terms of Stargate now, and I suppose it is. I'm just going to open up this curtain to give us a little. It's got dark all of a sudden. Uh, 
Ah, that's right. Okay. So, as I was saying, it probably starts at 10 years on now. And do you think there's an appetite now for a, a new sort of uh, Stargate sort of uh, franchise or a movie out there in the 21st century? You know, it is one of the great frustrating mysteries that our franchise sits around and collects dust. It makes no sense. It was a very lucrative franchise. Um, I tried to lease the franchise. I tried to buy it and lease it. And MGM was going through some difficult times. And um, I got some investors together and they had quite a bit of money and they really liked this idea. And I approached MGM and they said, well, we're going through some really difficult times right now, so we can't sell anything because it would be impossible to get any type of internal approval to sell assets right now. However, we can lease it to you. And so um, I hired the, uh, an ex-executive at MGM TV to be a consultant, and we came up with an offer that was, you know, it was a good offer. It was appropriate. And they liked the offer too. And so we were like, wow, good. We're kind of good to go. It would be like five year lease with the right of renewal. So 10 year total. And then um, they went bankrupt and literally you couldn't even reach anybody and there's nobody answering phones. So um, I knew that our show had made a lot of money. Stargate had made a lot of money. Stargate Atlantis had made a lot of money. They made a lot of money for MGM. It, they were huge cash cows for MGM. And at one point, I believe they were the only ongoing production. And they were, they were the thing keeping the lights on at MGM. And so it was completely mysterious that they would let a show like this drop off. But then it makes sense because this thing got lost in the shuffle it reemerged as Spyglass Entertainment. I went and met the guys at Spyglass. Now, as it turned out, they were managing the assets of MGM. They didn't technically own them, um, but I gave them my spiel. I told them I had kind of a pre-existing deal and I'd like to revisit that deal. And after I explained the whole thing, they were like, oh, I, that's a really good idea. Um, we don't want to do it. <laughs> we're going to give this franchise back to Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich and they're going to do a movie. Okay. Now, I, I thought that was really mysterious because I said to myself, well, have you looked at how much money the movie made? Compare what the movie made to what we made. We have made billions, net profit billions for MGM. No way did the movie make anything close to that. And so why would you do that? That's the wrong investment. And it, I realized that studio executives are a very strange animal. For one, they're not unlike anybody else. They want to be at the cool party. The cool party is the movie and the red carpet and this and that. TV is the workhorse. TV is the unromantic angle. At least it was back then. It's gotten a little bit better. But TV was, you know, not glamorized. And TV, more importantly, the investment in TV takes many years to see the payoff. You have to amortize costs over really a five-year period, and you hope that you're going to get money back. A lot of those executives that would launch those projects wouldn't even be around to see the benefits of those projects. So they just weren't interested. They wanted to do the fast, the now, the good, and they wanted something to pop up while they were there as executives at that studio. They knew they weren't going to be there in four or five years. So why launch all these things and let somebody else get the benefit of them? So um, it was really frustrating. And I still think we suffer from that. Um, so I went back to them again after, I think, eight or nine months. And they said the same thing. And to my understanding, Roland Emily and Dean Devlin haven't done anything with it. So it, it's, it, it, you know what? You realize Hollywood's not very smart. They're just not smart. I mean, that thing is sitting there ready to work as a worldwide built-in fan base, and they just sit there. It's just absolutely stupefying. Um, so. I, suppose, I suppose, lastly, for the last 40 seconds uh, before I let you go, I asked this question to Rachel. It's kind of a sort of a tricky one, but um, just uh, if you, the character uh, John Shepard was put into a dictionary and it was left two sentences blank underneath, and they asked uh, Joe Flanagan. He's left what? Left two sentences blank underneath. 
right? And then Joe Flanagan, what would he like those two sentences to read in terms of uh, John Shepard? Shepard or Flanagan? Uh, what, uh, what what Joe Flanagan would like to, to about John Shepard? I think it would be, I think the first one would be like, uh, beware of clowns. Okay. Because we know clowns are really trying to kill us. And the other one would be, no matter where you go, there you are. Okay. I think that sums it up. Between those two things, you can survive a very, very, you know, acrimonious environment. Uh -uh. On that note, uh, Joe Flanagan, an absolute pleasure talking to you this evening. To Great dog indeed. To relive your memories of Stargate Atlantis and your portrayal yeah. as John Shepard in the iconic franchise. And uh, uh, Joe, if you're talking to Jason, you might hit us up and uh, we'll get uh, Jason on the show. And uh, thanks a million uh, for give, sharing your memories uh, this evening. And hopefully you the report well for you and uh, you'll get back uh, producing great quality work in the future. Good talking to you. Take care.